Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to Principles of Collaborative Automation. I am Jessica Kerr, better known as Jessitron, and I'm excited today to give you four principles or prerequisites of collaboration, along with four precautions or ironies of automation to watch out for. These principles come out of the resilience engineering community and studies of collaboration in humans and automations because we don't just work with humans anymore. We also work with software. And we work with software at a lot of different levels. So at one extreme, you've got like Patriot missiles. Patriot missiles wouldn't exist without the software making decisions while they're in the air. And then you've got like big machines and stuff that humans are just, humans are just there as backup, just in case. At the other extreme, you've got applications like the Philly ETE conference app that I downloaded today. I mean, it's, it's neat, but it's not essential to my conference experience. Um, and other little tools that we use every day are on that side. Um, business applications that we work with for our job are more collaborative than that, right? We can't do our job without them, and they can't do anything without us. We kind of have to work together. Somewhere in there is like, Google Inbox, that people, like, they don't know what to do now that it's not a thing anymore. So there, there is that sweet spot, I think, where a lot of companies wish their apps were, of automation that is integrated into our lives. Now, behind all of these automations, every piece of software is a person, or more likely, a team. And as a software team, we also use automation and software all day long at, at the one extreme. There's the software that we build in order to operate for others. So it's our job to keep that software running and be the backup for everything else that can possibly happen. And then there's the software that we work with day to day and is essential to doing our job, like our deployment system and our IDE. And we at least have some influence, if not complete control, over these automations that we, we need to collaborate with. At the other extreme, there are small tools that we could do. OK, no, I couldn't do my job without Git. I might be able to do it without grep. But there's all these little tools that, um, that make our lives just a little easier. And we have the ability to change these, to install new ones, to write them ourselves if we need to. I write a lot of little bash scripts that are these tiny automations over here. And that's the thing. That's what makes software teams unique because our software that we work with is alive and it's under our influence, at least. So we're the ones who change the software we build. And if it's hard to operate, that's on us. And we can change our deployment system and make it work with us better. And we can at least configure our IDE and, and um, get better at our source control and install little tools around it. And this, this is what makes a software team more than just a system. A software team is special because, OK, as a team, uh, I consider my team everyone required to do my job for me to be successful. And I consider success operating useful software that impacts the lives of other people. So I need that software to be running. That software is part of my team. I can't be successful without it. And I need all of that tooling in order to be able to change and get any information out of my software. I need to be able to see the logs and read the database and stuff like that. And all of that makes this into a socio-technical socio system. And it's a special kind of socio-technical system because every part is continually changing and learning. It's, there's a word for this, and it's a hard word, sorry, but it's a useful word. Symathesy, from the Latin sim together and mathesy learning, coined by Nora Bateson, anthropologist. And a symathesy is a learning system made of learning parts. Every team is a somathesy and every ecosystem, but a software team is special because our automations are part of that. They're not just a given that we have to work with. They're on our team, too, and they're learning from us. So somathesy is a system based on flows of mutual learning. And to grow this system, there's a limit to how many people you can add, and it's really low. 
but you can always increase the learning. The tricky bit is getting the learning across the line of representation. That's the boundary between the social and technical halves of the system. And this is limited to our screens and our command lines and the buttons that we make for ourselves. So like SSH at a crudest level. But this is, this is an obstacle to the flows of mutual learning that we get to affect with tooling. So this is why I get so excited about collaborative automation within software teams. And that's particularly what I'm talking about today in these pointers and principles of collaborative automation. Because since it's on our team, we have the ability to change it. We can make it a good team member. OK, and that's because we're going to engage in joint activity with our team members, including the software. And joint activity is defined as when we have one shared purpose and also our tasks are interdependent. So if I want to go have dinner tonight and I say, okay, let's all have dinner. You bring the meatloaf, you bring a pie, you make the mashed potatoes and I will bake the bread. And we'll meet here at six o'clock. Okay. That's just coordination coming to a common point, unless we're sharing a kitchen. And in that case, we have limited one oven that we're trying to, to share that resource, and we have limited counter space, and maybe we're working from a shared pool of ingredients, and suddenly our tasks are independent. And I need to, to cooperate with you on the oven timings, and I need to, maybe I'm gonna pick up the dishes that you left on the counter so that I have some counter space. Suddenly, that's a joint activity. Now, in software, our tasks are incredibly in interdependent when we're sharing a code base or even just uh, working on software that, that talks to each other at runtime. And that means we need to know something about joint activity. So studies of joint activity have identified four prerequisites that are really crucial to doing this successfully. And I'm going to go through all four of them. The first one is the basic compact. This is an agreement, usually unspoken, that we're going to work together for a common purpose uh, until further notice. And we'll, we'll um, notice and compensate for failures in collaboration. So in people, this manifests as if we're not going to come to work today, we call in sick and let people know. If we're out of the mutual purpose forever, then we don't just ghost, we resign. We let people know. But it's smaller than that too, because it, I might come in to stand up and be like, sorry, my, my kids were sick last night and I was up a lot and I'm a little cranky. So if I snip at you today, it's not you, it's me. There's degrees of collaborativeness, and they vary from day to day, and we can let each other know about that. Oh, counter example. Okay, okay, okay. This one time on an airplane, there was a fuel leak. And the people were lucky because somebody on the crew noticed that, that the fuel level on the left was going down, even though the engines were pulling from the right. And, and then they went and they looked out the window, and they are like, ooh, there goes the fuel. That's not good. <laughs> and only after that did they notice that the rudder was like way over to the right because of course the fuel leak is throwing the, the weight of the plane off balance and the autopilot is like, oh, lean in a little bit to the left. Guess I'll go this way. Oh, guess I'll go to the right a little further. And it's like slowly working harder and harder. And did it tell anybody about that? No. Pretty soon it wouldn't have been able to compensate and it would have been too late. Okay, teamwork is not about just try harder. Teamwork is about letting people know when it's harder than you expect it to be. Keeping each other up to date. That is part of the basic compact. Okay, example from production software. Um, everybody needs a health endpoint so you can say, hey, are you up, are you live, should I shut you down? But that's not a yes, no. The health endpoint should have things like, um, uh, yeah, okay, I'm, I've been up since this time. I'm at this Git SHA. I have um, so many database connections over, open, and my downstreams are, are good except for this one, which is failing, so I'm in fallback mode on that. I can work with that. I can help that piece of software do better by going and kicking its downstream or whatever. 
that's useful information. Um, and it's, it helps us all maintain the basic compact. So more on the basic compact. In addition to the uh, shared goal, and the until further notice bit, it means that the other pieces, uh, the other pillars of joint activity that we're going to talk about in a few minutes, when we notice a failure, we restore it. It's all about how we resolve small failures before they get big. In particular, it means that we don't swallow errors. We surface weaknesses. So don't swallow errors. I mean, yeah, you may not want to display them to the users, that's fine, but don't hide them from the humans on your team. Errors are data, and they're really important learning opportunities for us from the system. And your fallback can always be contact a human. If something goes wrong, in the end, let a human care, care for it. That is what we're good at. We're good at everything else that we didn't think to code in. And this applies with us as people, too. Teamwork is not about meeting your commitments. It's about coordinating. So I want to surface my weaknesses. I do not rely on the people on my team to be available 24-7. I mean, one of them is. But, but even that, sometimes he goes skiing, and then he's unavailable for a few hours. But, um, I don't rely on the people to be available all the time. I rely on them to be available sometimes and to tell me if they're going on vacation. But the thing is, if you're sick, I'm going to answer messages in Slack that are addressed to you. We work together so that someone on our team is available 24-7. Someone is on pager and, and on backup pager and will answer that call. From the outside, our team is reliable. We build certainty on top of uncertainty by working with each other. And it's the same with our software. I don't count on any particular instance of my software to be up all the time and continue serving requests forever. I just notice when it isn't and I give it some help. Certainty on top of uncertainty in the aggregate with lots of layers and humans. There is no resilience without humans. Uh, so right, I work with the software that I operate. This means that if my production software includes Kafka and uses that for queuing, I can't rely on Kafka. I'm operating it. It's on my team. And when it goes down, which it will eventually, then I'm going to be shocked and I'm going to be like, oh my god, how do I do this? And I'm going to be Googling a lot of things and trying to figure out how to pick up those lost messages because I am on the hook for that. I can't rely on it. I have to be able to work with it. Whereas, if I hire a service in another company, company boundaries are great for this, then worst case, Kafka goes down and I talk to a human. There is no resilience without humans. So I think it's Aizen is the service that we use for Kafka. Kafka is reliable to me because there's a human involved and I'm outside its socio-technical system, uh, which is much better than me operating it. Right, so that's an important distinction. Rely on the team, but not within it. Surface our weaknesses. That's part of the basic compact. And the next piece is we need to be mutually predictable. We need to understand what each other is going to do and generally uh, like be on the same page enough to predict what the other person is going to do. And the important bit is when we're wrong, we go back and restore that, that missing information. So in the dinner example, after we, we meet and we're eating, if I ask you for the salt and you don't also pass me the pepper, I can be like, you're supposed to pass the pepper when someone asks for the salt. And you can be like, why? And I can be like, I don't know. <laughs> but we can agree that we're all going to do that anyway. Um, on, on our team, this is in stand-up. I'm like, okay, we, we let each other know what's going on. I'm going to work on this ticket, and I think I'll create a new table. And somebody else can say, oh, yeah, that's what I would do. And somebody else will say, wait, wait, why? And then we can restore the information that we need. Um, Counter-example, autocorrect. My iPhone is not sufficiently predictive of me because I start a lot of sentences with kinda. Kinda's homesick today. No, iPhone, I have a daughter, and her name is Linda. <laughs> Stop it. Um, if you have a car that has that like driver assist thingy, mine doesn't. But 
but I wish it did because it has this thing where if you get too close to the car in front of you, it'll stop on the brakes, which is awesome unless you're trying to pass that car. And if you're trying to pass that car, the trick is you signal. If you signal to change lanes, then that automation can predict what you're going to do and act in accordance with that. That's collaboration. As a, a trivial example in software, those old style installers, I installed Git the other day and it popped a window and it's like, I am going to tell you my name and then I'm going to ask you some questions and then I'm going to tell you where I'm going to install it and then I'm going to install it and then I'm going to tell you what I did. Boring, but kind of comfortingly predictable. Kind of like that. Okay, more on mutual predictability. The trick here is that we need to be able to see into our automations enough to predict what they're going to do. They need to expose their state to us and what they're gonna do, and I need to be able to draw conclusions from that, like they're gonna do something that makes sense to me, which means they're not using AI. <laughs> or natural language processing, or machine learning. Now, you might have these things in your real software that you operate for users, okay? Because then you're justified in putting enough effort into it to get past that uncanny valley of, it did what? <sighs> we have an automation at Atomist that like tries to, it, it can't like go back and just fix commit messages when it doesn't like them, but it can yell at me. So here it is, I said, complain about undefined refs. And it's like, that doesn't start with a capital letter or is not in present tense. Well, it does start with a capital letter, but, and it is in present tense, but oh my gosh, that's a past tense verb. And I'm like, you stupid automation, there is more than one verb in this sentence. But of course it doesn't understand that. So this automation is eh, an LP do not want, do not approve. That is a counter example. Um, the thing is that predictability breeds trust. And if the automation, if you can't predict what it's gonna do, and it can't tell you afterward why it did that, why would you trust it? You're gonna avoid it. Um, earlier I worked at a payment processor and we had machine learning um, to detect fraud or, and to like make a guess about whether a transaction was gonna be fraudulent and accept or reject it. Reasonable, but thank you Europe for making laws that require you to actually say why you refuse to process a transaction uh, because, for instance, we had a, a, a relatively high number of transactions rejected from the Netherlands, among other things, and we didn't quite realize this until um, the developer did go in and make the machine learning model be accountable in the sense of it had to be able to tell the story of why it did the thing, and it had to like print the rules that, that were making it declare this one likely fraud, and it's like, oh, the country code is between 34 and 36, inclusive. Well, it turns out 34 is like Nigeria, and 36 is like Liberia, but there's the Netherlands at 35. <sighs> Once you look at that, you're like, oh, machine learning model, that is an enum, it is not an amount, quit it with the ranges. And so then we can do things better. That's an example of adding accountability. It's a lot of work. Just don't try to make your automation smarter than you. That's not their job. At the other extreme, what I do want out of my automations is I want them to teach me what they're doing and why. This is how we can increase predictability without making them stupider. So if a new person starts at Atomist, the first time they push to one of our node projects, they're gonna see in, in the Slack push notification a list of all the things that our, our delivery machine has decided to do with that, the list of goals that it's set. And then they're gonna gradually start to turn green. And then you can click through and see the logs and stuff like that. And I have plans to make this even smarter and make it so you can click through and see the code that made it decide to do that. And then it'll be even teachier. And that, that is the gold standard in my opinion. Not smart, teaching, right? So that's mutually predictable. Once we can make some attempt to predict what the other people and automations on our team are doing, then we can move on to directability. We also need to be able to influence what our teammates are gonna do, both human and technical. 
So in stand-up, I'm like, oh, I'm going to create this new table. It'll be fine. And, and somebody else might be, um, have you thought about how many link records you're going to need? And that might be a problem. And did you consider this edge case? And then we can come together and come up with something that makes sense to everybody. That's helpful. That's collaborative. The opposite of this is when you walk into, I don't know, the DMV, uh, some office to apply for something. And the person behind the desk goes, computer says no. That is where the software is in charge, and the human is subject to its whims. I can't even tell you why. Um, as, as a positive example, this one time, I worked at an insurance company, and we had this Java application, this internal Java application for like making insurance quotes that had no business still being in production. I mean, this was like 10 years old, and the problem was it was written in like 2000, and it had this hand-rolled object relational mapping framework with layers of hand-rolled caching on top of that that was just plain wrong and not functional. It was, it was not okay. We restarted it every night to clear the cache. It's insurance. Nobody cares. Um, but still, what kept it in production, what gave this uh, application years more life than it deserved, um, was the admin screens. Because we had amazing admin screens that let us see everything that was in the cache. We could change what was in the cache. We could clear it out. And then we could say to the person on the phone, because developers were first line support, yeah, sorry about that. Please try that one again. Um, that it gave us really good visibility into what was going on and control over what was going on. And that really added a ton of value to that software. It had problems, but humans could collaborate with it, even so. When we're mutually directable, then, as from an automation perspective, that means we don't just make decisions and start carrying them out. I mean, at some point, some decisions we're quite certain about, and we can do that with, but not all of them. As an example, a navigation in cars used to be terrible because it would tell you where to go, but not why it wanted you to go that way, and it didn't give you any choice, and it would be like, do a U-turn, do a U-turn, no. Now, now these days we use Google Maps and I'm like, how to get to the airport? And it's like, well, here's the shortest route. But you might want to go this way, but it's five minutes shorter and here's why, because there's traffic right there. So this is like a really good explanation of alternatives. It presents and explains choices. I also really like in Gmail how it offers like some autocomplete suggestions, but these appear in gray text and if... Um, if I hit tab, I get the thing, and I can see exactly what I'm going to get because it's in gray text in front of me, but I can also just keep typing, and it gets the flip out of my way, as opposed to autocorrect, which ducking goes back and changes what I already wrote. <sighs> <sighs> Positive example from Atomist, from our own automations, uh, one of the built-in ones is um, when a new repository is created, it notices, and it's like, hey, would you like to create a Slack channel where you can get notifications about this repository, and I'll link it up for you. And the standard practice is to create uh, a channel with the same name, so it gives me a button for that, our usual practice, but maybe I want a different channel, so here's a drop down, and at the bottom, it tells me, for anything else, type this. So the happy path is easy, the standard path is really easy, and everything else is possible. That's a good automation. I like that one. There's a funny thing about negotiations, right, while we're trying to work with the computer, that the person in a negotiation with the most flexibility has the least power. So if I am, you're a manager at, uh, you're at Comcast today, and I am trying to sell you some software, and you're authorized to spend up to $20,000 a year on developer tools, but but that's like your limit. And if I want to sell you my software for more than that, you're going to have to go back and get authorization from somebody else. And maybe we'll have another meeting next week. Meanwhile, so you have the power there. But I have the responsibility because I'm the one with numbers to meet this quarter. So if I want that deal to happen, I've got to drop to within your bounds. It's a funny thing. Less flexibility equals more power. Uh, but it's a thing, and I don't want that in my automations. Now, I can never make my automations, especially my developer automations, that it's not my full-time job to work on, I can never make them perfectly flexible, but I can make them get out of the way, worst case. 
I want them to keep the human in charge. And you know what? We did this manually before. We can darn well do it manually again if we have to. That's the worst case. So don't make decisions for people. Keep the human in charge. Give them information, options, and there's always the do-it-yourself. I'm out. All right. Uh, oh, and a nice example of this is like programs like Make and a lot of other command lines have dash dash dry run where it, it will make all the decisions, print out what it's going to do, and then you can decide whether to run the command without dry run or maybe you just want to do pieces of that and you'll cut and paste and do them yourselves. This also works really well in code. Um, so I love to separate the decision making. This is kind of a functional programming thing. Make, separate make the decision about what to do from actually do it because that's so much easier to unit test. I can test my decisions separately from the side effects. Uh, directable and predictable. So that's very nice. The last one is the hardest one. Common ground. Common ground, this is the shared mental models overlapping mental models and the shared language so that we can talk to each other and um, know what and, and really uh, coordinate. And this is incredibly hard to maintain. Mathematically, common ground is the stuff that we all know, and we all know that we all know it, and we all know that we all know that we all know it, and we all know that we all know that we all know that, and so on infinitely. It's mathematically impossible to obtain in the presence of uncertain message passing. Fortunately, we're humans, and there's such a thing as close enough. So if we're all in the same meeting, and our, our we, we decide, it is announced that we're going to use this new linting standard. We're going to order our imports like this. And then you and I are pairing later, and I start doing something different. And you're like, oh, uh, Jess, I, I, thought, I thought we were going to do this other thing. It was in this meeting. And I'm like, oh, thanks. I must have been asleep. That is an example of restoring common ground. And that's part of the basic compact is when we come together to restore common ground. Because in humans, common ground is just close enough. We think we all know it, and that lets us move forward. The trick is, when there is a failure, we act to resolve it quickly and collaboratively. We don't hide our ignorance from each other. The other piece about maintaining common ground is there's such a thing as too much information. It's actually quite easy to achieve. For instance, I do um, every afternoon. Most days I stream on Twitch uh, while I'm working because I'm working on open source, so I can do that. helps me focus. So I'm doing all my work in public, and hypothetically, other people at Atomist could watch that. But they don't. They have other things to do. Part of maintaining common ground is respecting each other's attention. Because maintaining common ground is the limit on our team size. And maintaining common ground with our software is the limit on how much software we can maintain. We're not limited by how much we can do. We're limited by how much we can know. And that's why we need overlapping mental models. And we need to be careful with each other's attention. Counter example, you've got software in hospitals that the nurse goes to bring up a patient record. And they get six pop-ups that they have to click through to get to the record to do their flippant job. Now, if one of those pop-ups is like, hey, there's these two medications that together are likely to cause a heart attack, and that's right behind a pop-up that says, oh, we're almost out of bed sheets. Yeah, that's not taking care with people's attention. That is not collaborative, because all the information is no information. Not helpful. So that's the trick about maintaining common ground. Um, having information available, but not so in your face, when you don't need it. Um, I'm, I'm currently trying to get better at web development because I'm mostly back end. And one thing that I really like about modern web development is the many layers at which I can restore common ground. Because when we have a bug in our software, that is an indication that common ground has broken down and it's time to restore that by figuring out what the heck it's doing that we did not expect and why. And I like that. I can look at the code, which is in TypeScript. I can look at the JavaScript that's compiled from that. I can look at the JavaScript in the browser and see what it's doing. And then I can also look at the React tab in Chrome. And that corresponds to my code. And I can check if that's what I thought it was. And then I can look at the HTML. And I can inspect the elements. And I can see the different styles. And some clue about why it picked that. I haven't really figured that out yet. 
I can also look at the JSON going back and forth to the server. At all these levels, the, there's human readability to restore the common ground. Every time there's a bug, I have many ways to check it out. And that's important because what we need is not to have perfect mental models all the time. That is not possible. It doesn't happen. We need to be able to get our mental model up to date at the relevant part when we need it to make decisions. And that's incredibly important. So common ground, yeah, it's the limitation. It's the limitation on um, how much complexity we can manage. And Brian Getz this morning talked about complexity, the way everyone talks about it in complexity, in computer science. We must fight the fight against the complexity. We must use our single weapon of composition to reduce it and simplify, 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 simplify. OK, OK, yeah, I get it. When we can simplify, that is a great thing to do. But our job is not to write simple software. Our job is to write complex business software in a complex business domain because that's what our software is good for, for taking the complexity off the hands of the users. The more complex our software is, the more useful it can be. So our job is not to eliminate complexity. It is to deal with it. I mean, yeah, any unnecessary complexity we can remove means more business complexity that we can handle, and that's excellent. But our only weapon is not reduction. We can balance the complexity with visibility, with feedback, with information that we get from the software. And we can build that in to our software and to our tools. John Olspa has a thing that Success leads to complexity. Now, that's definitely true, because the more customers you have, the more feature interactions and backwards compatibility and suddenly everything and, and scaling and everything gets harder. But the more complexity you have, the more success you can have, because it is the more you can do for your users. So there's a virtuous cycle between success and complexity. So we need to be able to handle more complexity. And what that means is more collaborative software. It needs to collaborate with us and our users, I mean, we, but we're used to thinking about the user interface. We also need to think about the oper interf operator interface because how our software interacts with us matters. That makes a huge difference in our team. So that custom UI on that insurance software was actually brilliant. Often, the operator interface is specific to your software. You can't just buy this and put in a platform. You can get tools that make it easier to build, OK, but you're going to have to build it yourself. I was working with um, Eric Evans a couple months ago. I was pairing with him on his personal project. And he's got this, um, this web app that he's building to um, do clever stuff with emails and analyze personal email and make some suggestions. Where he starts with that, the first UI he builds is his operator interface. So he builds this breadboard page, which slowly grew longer over time. And each function in his app has a button that he can push to test that particular function. So the four steps of Google authorization um, each have a button. And then there's like little signatures. Are you in or out? And, and buttons to log out so that you can test it again. And somewhere in the bottom, there's like, here's the messages that you got back. And you can do all these things. This is just to make development easier and debugging easier. I mean, you can build this after the fact when you figure out you need it for debugging. But oh my gosh, if you build it first, it's like, it's like a REPL except less broad. It's customized to what you need to know about your application. That's incredibly important. Your experience matters. And if your experience is really painful, then maybe this, your software isn't being a good team player. Maybe you can change that. Another thing to watch out for is that we have this metaphor in our culture of communication as message passing. And we think that every message is a unit of communication. But every message that we pass that is communicative depends on common ground depends on a conversation that's happened beforehand or shared experiences or an agreed upon API or a contract somewhere else. So when you can, try to have a conversation. And my favorite opportunity, like underappreciated opportunity to have a conversation uh, with software is in error messages. 
because error messages are the, the perfect time to suggest something else to do. Uh, Richard Feldman yesterday sh showcased um, a useful um, error message in Elm that was like, hey, I observed that you have typed phone n number. Um, but that's not in your, um, in your type. Maybe you meant phone number. And it's like super friendly. And that's great. Evan Chaplicki, who makes Elm, also uh, Jose Valim of Elixir, if you get a compile error and you don't know what to do, that's not you. That's a bug in the language. So let's call them help and guidance messages, both for our users and for ourselves, especially in development tools, because as a developer, um, I get error messages all day, right? My job isn't to get it right. My job is to get new error messages as fast as I can. And it really does become a conversation. And as soon as I get it right and it works, conversation stops. So the error case is the common case in development processes. So that's really important and a good opportunity to build common ground where it didn't exist before. Oh, here's an example. Um, a week ago, I was working on my little toy app and I'm trying to make this React app, and this is what it's supposed to look like. Uh, yeah, not a front-end developer. Um, but it wasn't looking like that. It looked like this. Completely blank, nothing rendering, and I'm like, ah, I don't know. But I looked at the console, and among others, I saw this error, and, and it, look, at it says, consider adding an error boundary to your tree to customize error handling. Oh, I love customizing error handling. That is my favorite yak to shave. And it gives me a link which is fantastic. And I go to the link and it teaches me how to do this code. And so now around that code mirror, which is somebody else's component, I've got an error boundary. And now it says, oh no, code mirror is broken. But it rendered the rest of the thing. It rendered the whole thing. It just gave me this error. And okay, place is not a function that's not terribly informative, but it was progress. And it did help me to get it right. Um, now, before I ship this, I should probably make a better error message than that, something more friendly to users, but in the meantime, it helped me, and that was something. I love customizing error messages. Okay, so common ground is our limitation in complexity, and we want more complexity, the right complexity. So work really hard at this. Okay, that's all of them. That is the four prerequisites of collaboration. Surface your weaknesses, display and explain plans, keep the human in charge, and give windows into your state while being careful with attention. And now it is time for the gratuitous cat picture. This, this is Pixie and Odin helping me with talk prep. They are using their cat talents of being maximally in the way. But it's actually time for the four ironies of automation. So these are things that you would think would be easier with automation, but they actually get harder. The first one is you want to think the smarter you make the, the, the automation, the less you need to pay the human who's operating it. <laughs> but the opposite is true. Because if I am responsible for making sure this software is doing the right thing, I have to be at least as smart as it. I have to understand everything it can do and be able to problem solve for things that it wasn't programmed to handle. And that is not cheaper. If you want to, if, if your objective is to reduce costs, you probably don't want DevOps. You probably don't want Agile. You probably want ITIL or Six Sigma or something like that. And that's legitimate. Automation is not about reducing costs. It's about increasing capabilities. It's about your application was accepted in two seconds instead of one to four weeks. It's about being able to have Patriot missiles at all. There's a, there was a, what do they call it? There was a retrospective study about some friendly fire incidents with Patriot missiles recently. And of course, like all of these things, it comes down to human error yeah, uh-huh. The thing about human error is it is always possible to settle the blame on the human because there's always something that human could physically have done differently. Now, why they would know to do that at the time is the real question. But if you're just looking to pin the blame, you can always pin it on a human. 
But the thing was, if you look farther, how much training did these operators have? Because these missiles are making decisions in the sky. And meanwhile, these operators have maybe six months of experience, mostly not at this station. And, and the training they received was mostly procedural, like happy path. I'm sorry, if you want procedures followed, that's what computers are good at. Humans need training and understanding so that they can problem solve in the moment and figure out everything else that you didn't plan for. That's what we are good at. All right, so yeah, you need more feedback and more expensive operators, but you're able to do more with the addition of automation. That's what it's for. The next irony is that you wanna focus on the happy path, right? Because that's the most important. That's 99% of all executions. Yeah, but it's one of hundreds or thousands of paths your code could possibly follow. And that matters. The first case to handle is not the happy case. It's everything else. Everything else, make the fallback case, just not die miserably. Just contact a human and let a human do something, especially in the automations that we write for ourselves. This is particularly powerful. We don't need to handle every case. Just, we used to do it by ourselves. We can do it by ourselves again in this case. And then as we get the weirder cases more often, we might choose to automate them. If you start with the, asking yourself, what's the worst that can happen? And then make that not that bad. Make it not worse than what happens now, for instance. Ping someone in Slack. That's what we do. I don't know what to do with this, uh, but I know who to contact. That's fantastic. And that person is a human, and that person can deal with it. That's ideal. So that's particularly... Um, useful for us. The third one is the irony that the more you automate the easy stuff, the harder you make the hard bits. And that's really bad. So when Kafka goes down, and I don't know anything about Kafka because it's just been running smoothly for six months and I forgot it was there and I don't even know where it's running anymore. That's not good. Whereas if I've hired Aizen to run my Kafka, those people are fixing somebody's Kafka errors all day. They are the right person, people to fix Kafka errors because their head is in the game. So that's significant. Um, when you add open source software or any software into your organization, you're adding a requirement for expertise. Uh, Dan Cook was talking yesterday about the problem with self-hosting is you need all kinds of skills that you don't need now if you're gonna run a data center. And the, our limitation is not how much we can do, it's how much we can know. And do you really need to add those skills to your ad tech business? No, you don't. So be careful with that. Um, Hila Peleg is a researcher and she, her team works on really, really good auto-completions, like how good of suggestions based on context and based on things they've done before can we offer people in their IDEs? But, but one of the things they've learned is you don't wanna be too good without being perfect. Because if the developer's just hitting tab a lot, yeah, yeah, that sounds good, then their head is out of the game. You need to keep devs in dev mode. Otherwise, they'll screw it up, you're not helping. The third one we've already talked about, the less, fle less flexible party has more power, more power. So make the best path obvious and make it easy, but never make it mandatory. You can alter people's behavior like this by what you make easy, but don't constrain them. You're, we're working with each other, we're on the same team. Finally, that's all of them. <laughs> okay, the, the thing about these ironies is they're, they're like serious trade-offs that you need to make when you're writing automations for someone else. But when we're writing automations or, or influencing the automations that we operate, they're not nearly as hard to overcome. We can overcome those. And we can make these automations be on our team. And that is, that is the main thing. Because software like this is never done, right? We're always trying to stay relevant in a changing environment, on changing hardware, with changing problems that we're solving, and changing expectations. So what we wanna do, and what our powers let us do, is let the humans do what we're good at. Social skills, those are necessary for knowing why we're doing this at all, very important. And the everything else. And if you need consistency, then move that functionality below the line. We get to choose 
whether it's the technical or social side of the system that's going to do a particular piece of work. And if we keep the mutual learning flowing, then we'll keep getting better. There is no done. There is no perfect. Your coworkers are never going to be perfect. Your automations are never going to be perfect. So make them collaborative. A lot of thinking went into this talk, very little of it mine. Here's a bunch of references. Thank you.